my title for this morning's talk was essentially that I wanted to, and it was one of those things where when I got the title of the insight for it a couple of weeks ago, it was like, yeah, I know exactly what that one's going to be about. So it was moving a, a prayer sort of practice or energy from holding on to lifting up. And then as the week got closer and I started to try and articulate or decide what I was going to speak to, I'm like, what, do, what did you mean by that? What do you mean holding on? And um, so there's been some clarification happening over the past few days as I tried to come to terms with how exactly that expresses. Um, and I think in general, it comes from the notion of a consciousness where we might feel some attachment to some opinion or some way of being or some situation or circumstance that has been comfortable for us in the past, right? And so to move out of holding on to that which is familiar, that which is comfortable, or that which, um, which we think is the right way of doing things, to move out of that holding on into a space of, act of actually lifting up is a beautiful process that I, I believe um, will support us in moving through some of the challenges that Tom articulated in that prayer so beautifully, right? There's a lot happening right now and we have our own ideas about how that gets resolved. Uh, and if we're not willing to let go of our way of viewing it, if we're not willing to open up and see that there might be a broader perspective or a deeper truth wanting to be revealed, then we're not really fully open to spirit's activity in bringing that circumstances about, right? So that's kind of what I'm thinking. So here's, I'm going to give you first an example from my own life in this last week, and then an example that we can draw from Jesus' work in ministry um, as he began that work. So the first one is last week, right after service, I left for Michigan to spend time with family. And what I recognize is that in some ways, our unity bubble, our Chicagoland bubble here, there's a, there's a certain perspective and consciousness here that's very evident. Um, and crossing the border over into Indiana and up into Michigan, it becomes evident that um, there's a very different way of viewing the world and there are very different perspectives just over state lines. Right, the, the, the Trump and Pence signs in those states far outnumber the Biden-Harris signs. And, and here where we are, it's completely the opposite. So there's a, there's a political shift, there's a cultural difference. There's, and I was very aware of um, my holding on to what I thought was the right way that people ought to be expressing, right? I was aware of my own discomfort in that stuff. And uh, so how many, how many know the, it's a sitcom that was on for six or seven years called Modern Family, which was a cool, it was very fun. I love this. It was a patriarch who married kind of a trophy wife who was Puerto Rican and from a different race. And there were two siblings, a gay and a straight. And um, the circumstances and the, the kind of complications that arose in the family out of the different perspectives they have always ended up being resolved because the love of family and the commitment they had to one another was greater than any of their differences. So I kind of love that. And what I realized this week going back to visit family is that I, we're, we're kind of a modern family of our own. Um, we've got some different perspectives and, and some different political views and some different cultural views. And it was most evident to me when um, when I was 12 years old, um, a man came into our lives, my family's life, that served as kind of a father figure for many years. And he is, he is an amazing character, wise and strong beyond measure. And he lives on a hilltop on a very rural road, which until very recently was a dirt road, so that kind of tells you how far out of the way it was, surrounded by cornfields. And he's planted a grove of pine trees all around it. So as you're driving by the road, you can't even see. There's a huge pole barn and garages and, and a house. You can't even see that because it's all camouflaged by, by these pine trees. Well, as I pulled in the driveway and drove up, he has a great big Trump sign stenciled and painted in black on the pole barn. And there are Confederate flags hanging around the property and I could just feel myself constricting, right? I have my view of what that means. Um, and then what I noticed is that he had also hand stenciled a Biden sign, but part of the Biden sign was covered up with these handwritten notes, sheet, sheets of paper that had been torn off and taped over whatever was after the Biden part of it. Um, and I have a pretty good idea of what that might have been, but I didn't look because my perspective wouldn't allow it. It turns out that another branch of our family is this delightful lesbian couple. And they had also been up to visit recently. And so they had torn off sheets of paper and written things like Biden 2020, Biden is great, love is love. And they had taped over whatever was on the other part of the Biden sign. 
And so when, um, as I was during our visit, we sort of walked by that and the owner of the property, the guy that's been a father figure for me, was delighted that this couple had stopped by and sort of challenged his view. And there was just this wonderful sort of laughter and interaction. And he talked about the conversation, the relationship that he would built with, these are basically in-laws, these in-laws, that because of my sort of holding on to my view, I wasn't allowing myself to enter into that kind of a conversation or that kind of a debate. Um, and so what I'm recognizing is that by holding on to that, it wasn't allowing space for a higher level and vibration and connection and conversation to be happening. So um, I, I took that in. And as we, as our visit progressed, we were able to kind of walk around the property and talk about memories of growing up and what the changes that had been made. And it completely shifted. And we actually found some common ground, even on some political issues. So for me i think that's sort of a beautiful demonstration of how it is that by letting go of the way we think we ought to be it by our own attitudes by our own opinions by our own kind of fixed perspectives we might be able to actually bridge some of the divides that seem to be such a powerful force in in our social and political and cultural dynamic right now jesus was brilliant at this and I think the story I want to share with you really is more about how we do that than exactly what the outcomes are, right? How many know, and most of you probably are fully aware of the story of um, the woman who was hemorrhaging, right? The woman who touched the hem of the garment and instantly in touching that hem, she was healed by her faith. We all know that story, right? What you may not be aware of if you aren't a, if you haven't really studied the Bible or reread the story in a while is that's actually just a small scene within a bigger story. In the larger story, Jesus has just crossed over the sea and he's entered into a new place. It's kind of his word about his ministry and the healing and the miracles that he's been performing is just starting to get out. So people are really curious and crowds come out to meet him and they crowd around him on the banks of, of, this, of this body of water and they're just pressing in on him, very curious about what's happening. They aren't necessarily believing all of this yet, but they want to know about it, right? So he's just surrounded. And out of that crowd, one man comes forward and his name was J J Jairus. Sorry, got that wrong. Jairus. He was a synagogue leader. So he was a, a leader of a sort of a faith leader like Chet is today for us. He was a faith leader and his daughter was very ill and he wanted Jesus to come to his home to lay hands on his daughter so that he would so that Jesus could cure her. Right. That's sort of the setup. So Jesus agrees. He consents and they head across town and the throngs of crowds are then surrounding them. And it's in that throng of crowds when the woman touched his hem. And here's the thing that I would like to suggest. So in the midst of that, if if in my own work, in my own journey, if I've got an objective in mind, if I've got a task that I'm wanting to, to get done, if I've got sort of my way of doing things, I tend to be pretty singular. I'm not a great multitasker, right? If I want to get to a house to do something, that's what my mind is on. Jesus is doing this amazing sort of balancing act where he's able to say, focus enough on the objective but aware enough to recognize when the woman has touched the hem, right? He feels a, a transfer of energy in the interaction and can sort of swing around and turn back and acknowledge it. You know, and that's, he's like, the disciples are like, how, what do you mean who touched you? There's a thousand people around you, all these crowds. What do you mean who touched you? But Jesus was aware enough, um, even in the midst of this kind of determination to, to finish the initial task that he was after, aware enough to acknowledge it and, and affirm her faith for her, right? So he does that and then the story goes on. And this is the part I wanna read. We're, we're looking at chapter five from the book of Mark. Um, so, and this is the passage where he has, um, um, he's just, he's the, the woman with the hemorrhage is healed and they're moving on. So while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside 
and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was about 12 years of age. So here are the pieces I think that are instructive for us as we're looking to move from holding on to whatever it is that we've got, that have got their hooks in us, right? Whatever, if that's a perspective, if that's an opinion, if that's a way I want things to happen, if that's even a way of being in prayer so that I can receive the divine, um, to let go of that so we can be more fully open, Jesus is giving us some really wonderful instruction. First of all, he's not distracted by the crowds, right? He leaves them behind. He tells them to stay. He takes with him only those, um, James, John, Peter, James, and John, only those disciples who can support him in the work that he is about to accomplish, right? He's, he's sort of eliminating all of the other noise, all of the commotion. To some degree, I believe that's what we need to do. You know, I mentioned earlier that in Chicago here, we're in kind of a bubble. That bubble, when we're in the midst of, um, of uh, that, that bubble is akin to us creating a sort of sanctuary around ourselves so that we're not allowing all of the noise and all of the distraction and all the craziness that's going on in the outer world to distract us or take us away or drag us away from what the truth is that we're really about, right? So it's not to say that we're ignoring it. He still is aware, he knows the crowds are there, but he knows when, he, when, where, he has to sort of draw the line to be able to protect his own ability, his own power to be effective in what he wants to accomplish, yeah? Um, and I love it that once he finally arrives at the house, right there at the house of the synagogue leader, and there's this commotion, there's the weeping and the wailing and all those who have already made a determination about the end of the story, about how this story was gonna end. And they even laugh at him, they even ridicule, like what, he's crazy, what's that happening? Um, there are those distractions in our own experience as well. Think about how it is that the commotion that you encounter as you begin to know truth, as you begin to claim your power, as you begin to step into a higher level of prosperity or a different level of consciousness, that there are those voices, sometimes they're even, um, you know, the, the thoughts in our own heads, the thoughts that we're carrying that would distract us from the truth of that and keep us hooked back in that old way of thinking and being. But he leaves those outside. Jesus leaves those outside and takes only those who will support him into the house to create the miracle, right? The same is true for us. There is a balance to be struck between being informed about what's happening in the world and being open enough and aware enough to be engaged about where we can effectively use our power and influence, yeah? So what I would invite you to consider as we particularly think about moving into this period, because we know as we get closer to the election that the noise and the commotion and the divisiveness is just going to increase. And so what I would like to invite you into is to think about where it is that you can create that sanctuary for your own soul so that you can be as Jesus was fully aware of when, when your power is being effective, when you need to pay attention and be fully attentive and what the distractions are that can be let go of and move into a higher level of effectiveness in terms of bringing forth the peace and the love and the desire of your own hearts, yeah? I know we all have those relationships, those interactions, we all have those, those places where we're holding on and to be able to strike a balance between holding on and lifting up as a part of our spiritual growth and journey. And we're gonna get plenty of practice at working with those as we move through these next few weeks. So what I'd like to do now is prepare for a time of meditation um, I, I think it's going to be a delightful treat. Ann Baker, who is the founder of Essence Health and does amazing sort of energy work and also has a deep background in traditional medical science. So she's got this wonderful consciousness that she brings into her work and she has agreed to lead our meditation today. So Karen is going to set up the space for us and then Ann will lead us in meditation. I will be gentle with myself i will be gentle with myself and i will hold myself like a newborn baby child so i invite you to sing that to, with me just really soft i will be gentle with myself 
I will be gentle with myself and I will hold myself. I'll hold myself like a newborn baby child. I will be tender with my heart. I will be tender with my heart. I will be tender with my heart and I will hold my heart. I'll hold my heart like a newborn baby child. Sing that line again. I will be tender with my heart. I will be tender with my and I will hold my heart. I will hold my heart like a newborn baby child. Let's sing one more. I will be easy on myself. I will be easy on myself. I will be easy on my, and I will love myself. I'll love myself like a newborn baby child. I will be easy on myself. I will be easy on myself. I will be easy on my, and I will love myself. I will love myself like a newborn baby child. Just that last line, I will love myself. And I'll love myself like a newborn baby child. Okay, everyone, I invite you to close your eyes and begin to turn within creating that sacred space within. I came across a quote this morning that I don't think was an accident by a 14th century mystic and poet named Lala. She says, I've traveled so far seeking God, but it was only when I gave up and turned back, there he was within me. So we begin by observing your breath. Just notice that by observing the breath, it becomes slower, deeper. I invite you to consider the inhale as a welcome, welcoming you, welcoming your feelings. Just welcoming what's here in this moment. And the exhale as a natural letting go. The settling within. Inhale as a welcome, and the exhale as a natural letting go. I invite you to bring your attention down to your feet. Maybe wiggling your toes and your shoes. Bring all your attention down to your left foot and your right foot. And both feet. Feeling your feet on the ground. Imagining the earth below the ground that your feet are on. Feeling that connection with that force of creation.
that has unimaginable intelligence and power that we are held within. With the next exhale, just relax into that holding, that support. That mystery. Then we gently bring our attention up to our heart. Noticing any tightness. Allowing your breath to expand the chest, the heart. So that with your awareness, you're not just noticing, but you can be in your heart. Imagining the breath is coming in and out of the heart. Imagining the heart is breathing you. The heart as loving presence. Breathing you. Allow yourself to dissolve in this loving presence. And from this space, I'm going to ask two questions. Just allow the questions to just land wherever they need to land. In this moment, what needs to be received? What needs to be received? The next is what needs to let go? What needs to be released and let go? I will give gratitude for what was received and released. I 
And take a deep breath, breathing that sense of gratitude, maybe a new inspiration or a sense of freedom or lightness. You can send an intention of keeping that openness, that feeling through the rest of your day in the coming weeks ahead. And gently open your eyes. I will be gentle with myself. I will be gentle with myself. And I will love myself like a newborn baby child. Sing that with me now. I will be gentle with myself. I will be gentle with myself. And I'll love myself. I'll love myself like a newborn baby child. So let's affirm it and say, I am gentle. I am gentle with myself. I am gentle with myself. And I love myself. I love myself like a newborn baby child. Say it one more time. I am gentle. I am gentle with myself. I am gentle with myself. Love myself. Love myself like a newborn baby child. And I rock myself. And I rock myself like a newborn baby child. And I hold myself. And I hold myself like a newborn baby child. And let's end with I love myself. And I love myself like a newborn baby child. Hey, thanks for watching this YouTube video. If Unity's message of positive spiritual living resonates with you, I hope you'll subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date on other lessons as we post them. Also, if you're able to support us financially in the work that we do in the world, Please check below for contact information. You can visit our website, find more about what programming we offer, as well as how to give. Blessings.